As we come together this morning, let us renew both our commitment and our covenant. For those grieving losses, may their hope be uplifted. For those wrestling with questions that seem to have no answers, may they find renewed strength. For those cherishing joys, may we join in the celebration. And may we covenant to honor the many paths that have led each of us to this community. Now we will light our chalice. Janet's gonna light the chalice and we can read the words. <laughs> we promise ourselves to the idea that we are each and all human beings and that there is something moving between us that we cannot tame or measure. This chalice is a reminder that what flame we keep inside us cannot light the way. The light must spill to shine. And this is a new hymn for many of us, so you can remain standing. And Ellen's going to play it through once. It um, has a number. 1058 in the teal hymnal, or the words are on the screen. This morning is by Matt de la Pena, and the pictures are by Corinna Loiken. It's called Patchwork. You were blue before you were even born. And here you are today, blue dressed in blue. But sometimes your paintbrush at school hovers over the pink. And some days so much hurt floods your eyes, you're scared to even blink. But tears are not pink or blue or weak. They're human. And you are human. And when you grow up, the color you will come to love most is brown. You were put on this earth to dance. We know, we know. Ballet, tap, hip hop, your body bending to the beat, leaping from note to note, dipping into demi plie. You dream in one, two, three, one, two, three. But those rhythms inside your head are also a kind of math. And one day you'll discover coding and change the way the world moves. You go everywhere with a ball in your hands. We see, we see. You are basketball, baseball, football, any kind of ball, and you were born to compete. Even in defeat, the game feeds you, it leads you. And soon you will see your sport for what it really is, an expression. The sound of a bouncing ball is the language of your loneliness. You are bilingual. And one day you will carry words with you instead. You will spin couplets on your finger because you've always been a poet. 
You are the kid perpetually in timeout. We sigh, we sigh. You shove and cut the lines and talk over the teachers. You tell jokes during the pledge and your whole body buzzes when you get a reaction. But the skill it takes to make people laugh is the skill you'll use to help people learn when you become a favorite teacher. And when a restless kid like you lands in the back of your class, you will see her and you will love her. You are kind to everyone and everything. We beam, we beam. When you win, it feels to you like a loss. The other's disappointment is a knot inside your stomach. You sit beside the new kid at lunch and you give away your only cookie. But do not mistake kindness for a weakness. You are a powerful magnet, pulling people. Crowds will one day swarm to your ideas and will look to you for guidance eager to follow, and they will follow. You are more than a single note played over and over again. You are a symphony. You are sounds plucked from all the places you've been and all the people you've met and all the feelings you've felt. You are blues and pinks and loneliness and laughter, mismatched scraps accumulated over time and stitched together into a kind of patchwork. And even when your pattern loses its design or grows lopsided or tangles or is hard to follow, it will be beautiful. That's a brand new story that Jessica found. Now I invite you to rise again in body or spirit and join in singing hymn number 1051 in the Teal Hymnal. We are for each child that's born.
standing up. It's time for our greeting and we can turn around and greet everybody who's on Zoom, all 47 screens on Zoom. And then say hello to one another. Oh my God, I totally love this book. Isn't that good? Oh my God, it's amazing. Hello, everyone on Zoom. It's so good to see you all. Hi, Joanna. Hi, Paul and Wally. Amy, Georgia, Jean, Evelyn, Rich, Laura, good to see you, Rebecca, good to see you, Russ, hope you're doing okay, Leanna, so many people, good to see you all. It's very noisy in the hall today, I can't hear a thing, we must have 80 people here. <laughs> So we are a mighty force between you all and the people in the hall. Woo. It's wonderful to be here. I'm going to have to use the bell. <laughs> Haven't had to do that that loudly in a while. It's good. It's wonderful. It's wonderful to see so many of you here and 47 screens on Zoom. So as I said to the folks on Zoom, we are a mighty force this morning. Uh, and now it's time for everyone who is going to religious education activities to leave us and we will sing you out. Laurie Loisel, and I was asked, sorry, it's okay. <laughs> I was asked by the nominating committee to speak about being co-moderator of the council, the coordinating council. This is one of several elected positions for which the nominating committee recruits candidates to be voting, voted on at annual meeting. For many years, I did not take on elected positions initially because I had young children and work full time and beyond that could barely manage necessary self care. Then there were work related reasons I couldn't. And when those things cleared up something else got in the way. I noticed that I thought other people knew how to do this better than I ever could. Um, I thought I didn't belong there that maybe I would in the future when I had reached some kind of emotional or spiritual enlightenment. <laughs> In the meantime, I knew that great big monolith they would keep doing the work. And then it hit me like a ton of bricks. They is an illusion. I came to see that I was holding back partly out of fear and that for me, actively embracing that I am part of we was my spiritual work. We includes me, even when my mind tells me it doesn't. Last spring, when the call went out for a co-moderator for the council, I said yes, even though I wasn't really sure how to do it. There seems to be a bit of a mystery around the council, around what the council is and who belongs. It's a forum for communication, program planning, and building community. And we all belong. Committees, teams, and working groups are asked to send representatives to the monthly meetings, but everyone is welcome. It's not a perfect system by any stretch, Sometimes people come to the meetings and wonder why they're there. Do they really belong? So many of us are haunted by that question. And I wonder if recognizing that might help us be more of the welcoming congregation we want to be 
and if folks might be willing to say yes when approached by a nominating committee member. You can even volunteer without being asked first. Um, and then I have a um, little social justice minute. Um, you don't need to repeat my name. Uh, let's see. Twice a year, the Coordinating Council asks for nominations of organizations to donate money <clears throat> from our share of the plate collection, where we give away half and keep the rest for our own operating expensive expenses. We choose groups whose work aligns with our values and principles. This year, with our focus on the UUA's proposed eighth principle to build a multicultural beloved community dedicated to taking actions to dismantle racism, we're particularly looking for nominations of organizations focused on racial and social justice, especially any led by people of color. We hope to explore ways we might partner more deeply than simply financially. So when making nominations, you might keep this intention in mind and suggest accordingly. We vote on nominations at the February 3rd Coordinating Council at 6.30 via Zoom. Did you get that time right? Yeah. <laughs> I just show up when my calendar dings. <laughs> um, please send your nominations with a link to the organization's website or other information to council at uunorthampton.org. Everyone present has a vote and everyone is welcome at the meeting. Thank you. And I'd just like to add to what Laurie said that sometimes people nominate organizations that they're connected with and that helps us then um, sometimes make a connection, a, a more personal connection with the organization. So if there's, if there's a, an organization you know that you're working with or that you have worked with, or if there's um, some other idea that you have, please, please, please share it. Um, you can email council at uunorthampton.org or you can send an email to Lori or to Jessica or Steve, um, Steve Kramer. Our generosity on Sunday mornings and throughout the rest of the year makes everything we do possible. And as Lori said, it helps us support the work we do here and the work in the greater community. And on the slide, you will see um, for the next to last time, the organizations that we've been supporting since um, September, we have sent, we will send, um, we will we'll have sent about $6,000, right, Dave? About $6,000 to the five organizations that we supported. Um, for the first half of the year. So that is wonderful. Really um, a, a real tribute to, to all of us. And um, it's very much appreciated. So now our morning offering will be given and gratefully received.
Your uh, order of meeting is missing the name of the, inter the um, information about the interlude after the meditation. It is Nature Boy by Eden Abes. This comes from Thich Nhat Hanh. Invite you to take a breath, put your feet on the floor before we begin. Let us be at peace with our bodies and our minds. Let us return to ourselves and become holy ourselves. Let us be aware of the source of being common to us all and to all living things. And let us fill our hearts with our own compassion towards ourselves and towards all living beings. Let's take time together in silence.
This is something called Grounded Someplace Deeper by a UU minister named Mark Ward. He writes, reason is an important tool, sure, an essential arbiter of truth claims about the world, but religion is grounded someplace deeper where we experience the joy of living and are connected intimately with all that is. Religion is an entirely human experience that we get in touch with using some pathways other than intellectual argument. In religion, we seek to address not just what is, but also what we hope for and what we dedicate ourselves to. We rely on it to navigate the shoals of love and grief, compassion and estrangement, gratitude and disappointment, mystery and wonder. Religion deserves reverence, and it also requires a vocabulary and a theology. This theology does not demand intervention of unearthly forces, but it does invite us to open ourselves to different ways of living and learning. It considers the human niche a vast intertwined plenitude of being. Just what is that niche? Our next hymn is number 1068, Rising Green. Please rise in body or spirit and join in singing.
You are sounds plucked from all the places you've been and all the people you've met and all the feelings you have felt. How do we become who and what we are? What is human nature and why do so many people wonder about it? I actually looked it up in the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy, which was hard to understand. <laughs> but I think what they said was that the interest in human nature comes because we would like an accurate and full, because an accurate and full picture of human nature helps us understand other aspects of human culture and behavior. You can go look at it and see if you can agree with me that the first paragraph, that's what it says. I think it also comes from the fact that human beings are fascinating creatures and we're curious about many things, including ourselves. So people have speculated about human nature for forever. And today there are biologists and neuroscientists and geneticists and archeologists, anthropologists, sociologists, psychologists, philosophers, ethicists, and religious thinkers, theologians. You can probably think of others who study and ponder about human nature. Certainly, I would add artists to the list. This is a quote from Shakespeare. It's um, Prince Hamlet talking to his two university friends, Rosencrantz and Guildenstern. You'll recognize, many of you will recognize this speech. He says, what a piece of work is man, how noble in reason, how infinite in faculty, in form and moving, how express and admirable, in action, how like an angel, in apprehension, how like a god, the beauty of the world, the paragon of animals. Well, it turns out that little speech is actually fairly ironic, but he is expressing the educated consensus of his time about human beings and human nature. He's describing aspects of Judeo-Christian theology that has colored all of Western thought from the common, before the common era through today. And in the book of Genesis, God created humankind in his image. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and have dominion over every living thing. God saw everything that he had made and indeed it was good. So that Judeo-Christian tradition from which Unitarian Universalism springs originated, sees human beings at the top of the food chain, having dominion singled out by, made in the image of God. And in that tradition, there's the other side of human nature, the side that the devil plays to. It is our animal side from which springs lust and jealousy and greed. And that is actually the side that Hamlet has in mind during that speech, because he is saying it ironically brooding about his father's murder and his mother's complicity in that murder and her infidelity. Sometimes Unitarian Universalists are guilty of a form of hubris when we deny that the Judeo-Christian tradition has anything to offer our understanding of human nature or anything else. But we recognize that that tradition has shaped all of Western thought. It affects our understanding in more ways than we can imagine, whether we like it or not through its framing of the questions, through our language, our cultural assumptions, our social and political institutions. And one question is, are humans fundamentally good or, funda or fundamentally flawed, even evil, or neither? Unitarian, the universalist side of our tradition, which dates to the 18th century, says that humans are at heart good. And the universalists got in trouble with everyone else because they said that God was a loving God and that no one burned in hell forever. Not very many other Christians at the time liked that theory. 
So as Unitarian Universalists, the part that we inherit from that is the affirmation that e of each person's inherent dignity and worth, which is, as I've said before, one of the two th important things, one of the important things my two sons took from their years of us taking them to the UU church, and it's something that they still cherish. But as you use in general, we're not very strong on grappling with evil or why we ourselves can be callous and cruel or why our societies and homes are full of injustice, violence, oppression, and inequality. So there's a more liberal modern side of the Christian tradition, tradition that teaches that human failures, sins, stem in part or maybe largely from fear, from existential fear, because we're aware of and are afraid about our own death. And because of this fear, we fail to trust the goodness of creation, God and each other. And because of this fear and lack of trust, we overreach, we seek power, we cling to way more than we need. So I was, as I was thinking about those ideas, I, I see the idea that evil comes from our failure to recognize and honor our interdependence. That notion that human beings are set apart from the rest of nature and godlike as a result seems to me to be a fundamental mistake that has had and continues to have huge, huge consequences for human society and for our planet. And so I think you, you theologians, including all of us, maybe should think about centering the importance of interdependence. Because how did humans, particularly in the West, come to the conclusion that they are supreme? And how did we generally, individually or collectively, get to be the way we are? One of the essential debates about what it means to be human and about why and how we are who we are is the argument that's been framed forever as nature versus nurture. And I love the fact that Ellen played two sati pieces um, this morning because it reminds me of our younger son, Elliot. We played, still do, uh, all kinds of music in our house. And once when he was seven or eight, we were playing a CD of sati and he came into the living room and he was listening to it. He goes, what is that noodle music? <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, exactly. But where did he get that from? He still loves heavy metal. Those on the nature side agree, argue that our personalities and our proclivities are largely determined by our genes. The nurture camp argues they're primarily a function of culture. Neither one completely denies the existence of the other, but the, the nature side says strongly, you know, most of it's about the equipment we were born with. And the nurture side said, nope, most of it's about culture, the way we, our lived experiences and how we respond to our environment. Tim Ingold is an anthropologist and an emeritus professor at the University of Aberdeen in Scotland. And he studied hunter-gatherer peoples in Northern Finland and I think elsewhere. And he wrote a book called Against Human Nature. He says, the circumstances of development are continually shaped through human activity. There is no way of describing what human beings are independently of the manifold historical and environmental circumstances in which they become. Steven Pinker on the other side is a Harvard psychologist who wrote a best-selling book 20 years ago called The Blank Slate, The Modern Denial of Human Nature. And Pinker says, we come into the world with more or less what we become, like the boy in the story who was blue even before he was born. Pinker writes the book, he says, to explore why the extreme position that culture is everything is so often seen as moderate, and the moderate position is seen as extreme. People who are on the strong nurture side of the argument, like Ingold, say that it's wrong and dangerous to even speak about human nature as if it exists. 
and is something that's inherent in everyone, or that's inherent in everyone in different ways. An example of the danger, you can probably think of lots of them, having to do with gender oppression and racial oppression and all kinds of things like in that area. But another is an assumption that we are naturally tribal beings and that therefore those characteristics doom us to never being able to live together in ways that treat all people equitably and fairly. Now, I certainly don't have the scientific background to back up the arguments of either Pinker or Ingold. And most of us would say, I think, that we were born with certain abilities and characteristics, like a preference for heavy metal over noodle music, and that we're shaped, maybe, <laughs> and that we're shaped by our environment and culture, beginning even before we emerge from the womb. Why are we the way we are, both collectively and as individuals? How does the child who loves to dance grow up to love math and systems? Or the restless clown in the back of the class grow up to be a beloved teacher? And what do you believe is essential about being human? How do you believe we become who we are? Does it matter? I think it does. Because we all carry models in our minds about what it means to be human, about our dominion over animals and the natural world, about our personal place in that so-called food chain, about who and what matter more or less. We may realize some of the flaws in our models but it is hard to escape their influence. And a lot of our models are not really within our awareness. <laughs> we carry models in our minds about what it means to be normal. We use expressions like on the spectrum to describe responses and behaviors that suggest a greater or less ability to pick up cues from other people or to know what's appropriate in a given situation. We categorize and name abnormal states of mind and educators also operate with a huge set of understandings and assumptions about human capacities and nature. Now, I don't know about you, but when I went through school, we were grouped by, and it was pretty obvious how smart we are. In first grade, the reading groups were called kings and queens, princes and princesses, and dukes and duchesses. Now, every kid in every six year old in that class knew who was which. I couldn't imagine being anything other than a queen. <laughs> right? If you went through a school system like that, and I know a lot of you did, how did that shape you? Fortunately for a little bit for my own sense of humility, I was also the kid who was picked next to last for kickball and one of the kids who couldn't draw. Parents, parents operate with assumptions about their children, who they are, who they hope they will become, what's good for them and bad for them, what's important for them to experience, what's important to shield them from. And some parents go through hard times when we wonder what we could or should have done differently. Believed and done differently. And our own parents operated with a set of assumptions about us. Maybe we wish they had done differently at times or believed differently at times. I don't know if my own parents ever thought deeply about the assumptions they were making as they were raising us. I'm pretty sure they never thought about a theology of what it means to be human. So Dick Gilbert is a retired UU minister from the big Rochester church who wrote a curriculum that's been used for many years called Building Your Own Theology. And then that, Dick writes, 
We are all theologians. We all ponder the great life issues. As Unitarian Universalists, we celebrate common values that unite us, even as we enjoy a diversity of perspectives that enable us to learn and grow religiously. And he says, religion is the core of ultimate meanings, values, and convictions to which we commit ourselves. The core of ultimate meanings, values, and convictions to which we commit ourselves. Theology, theology is the reflection on religion. Theology is the reflection on that core of meanings, values, and convictions out of which we live our lives. So what's interesting to me is that the three great religions of the book, as they're called, which are Judaism in sort of chronological order from oldest to newest, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, all ground their theology in their scripture. As Unitarian Universalists, we ground ours in a set of common values. We ground it in our lived experience and in wisdom we may find in other sources, including our Judeo-Christian roots and many other places. And we encourage and support one another in exploring and defining and revising our own theological understandings. So you might want to think about your own theology of human nature. It doesn't have to be a, a single sentence. Mark Ward, the minister who wrote the reading that I read earlier said, we are fragile, fallible sorts for whom just being is a blessing and love is a pole star. I think it was about a year ago I suggested, was there, I think there was a, you know, come up with your, with your theology in 12 words. Well, this is, this is not that. <laughs> you can ask yourself what is most important to you about being who you are <clears throat> and about how you became that person and about who and how you are still becoming. If you're raising children or watching your own children raise your grandchildren, you might ask yourself what's important to you about who they become. I know I wanted my own children <coughs> to know and cherish and use their own gifts. I wanted them to be kind. I wanted them to be amazed and curious about the wonders of the world. And I wanted them to always know how much they were loved. this far. Maybe there's a clue to my own theology in there somewhere. To be fully human, we need one another. We need to love and we need to be loved. This comes from Fred Gillis, a beloved UU minister who served our association in several congregations and who died about 10 years ago. May the love which overcomes all differences, which heals all wounds, which puts to flight all fears, which reconciles all who are estranged, be in us and among us now and always. <coughs> Our final hymn is number 10, Immortal Love. Sorry, you'll have to use the hymnal because <coughs> this is the day for gremlins. We don't know what that gremlin is, but it turned off the screen.
the spirit overseeing all, eternal love remains. Go in peace. Whole world is born.